guys, welcome back to a new episode of Tenacious V's podcast. Every episode, I grab some drinks and some friends, and we discuss a woman from history. We talk about myths and legends and real-life women who've made a difference and just all sorts of things, and it's a really fun time. We do a lot of research to prepare, and then I teach my friends all about them. Um, so this week, we're going to be discussing Susan Lafleche picot the very first Native American doctor as far as the American medicine is concerned. She was pretty fucking amazing. She was a huge advocate for cleanliness and self-health care, an advocate for making everyone healthier and safer and doing as much as she could for her community all the time. She was very involved in her whole environment and all the people around her looked up to her and she was just a great woman so I really hope you enjoy learning about her Ionia and welcome back to a new episode of Tenacious V's podcast. This week we are going to be discussing Susan Lafleche Picot. Me and Johnny and Will here, and we've got the two dogs. So, what do you guys know about Susan Lafleche? I know that sounds like a very French name. Yeah, that's really all I'm getting. Is um, that correct? Is she from France? Nothing. Not from France. Interesting. She, um, Austrian. No. Native? Mm-hmm. Okay. Ah, uh, French. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what I said there was, how are you? In Omaha. So she's a Omaha woman, which is a tribe in um, Nebraska. They're from the Lake Nebraska Plains area. Is that the city named after the tribe, obviously? Yeah. Uh, what was her name? Susan Lafleche Picot. Picot sounds right. Okay. So I actually didn't know a whole lot about the Omaha tribe before doing my research on this one. And I had never heard of this woman before. So I think this one's really interesting. And um, Omaha actually means against the current. And if anyone exemplifies that phrase more, it's it's Susan. Like, she's amazing. Fucking... Now that I know what that is, I fucking really love that. Against the current. Mm -hmm. Hell yeah. Yeah. That was great. A maverick. Oh, so that was right. I heard there was someone independent. Yeah, we are. Very independent. Mm -hmm. Um, So Susan was born in June of 1865 on the Omaha Reservation in what is now eastern Nebraska. Um, Her parents were both mixed Native and European and they lived off of the reservation for periods of time. Like, both of your parents left the reservation at some point and came back, is what I mean by that. Her father was Joseph Lafleche, or Iron Eye was, like, a big name of his, and he became the chief, like, a little later on in her life. Like, when... So, that was pretty cool. Um, He was of Ponca and French-Canadian ancestry, hence the Lafleche. Probably. Yeah. Okay. And he went to St. Louis, Missouri for education, but returned to the Omaha Reservation. Uh, He fully culturally identified as Omaha, and like I said, he became the principal leader of the tribe or the chief around 1855. So I guess actually before she was born. My bad. (laughs) This is when he became the chief of the tribe. Yeah. She was born to the chief? To the chief, yeah. So he, he had been chief for 10 years when she was born. Wow, okay. Um, her mother was Mary Gale, and she was an Omaha and Oto, Iowa heritage. And she was the daughter of an American army surgeon. Mary spoke and understood English, French, and Omaha, but she would not speak in any language other than Omaha. I love that. Is yeah. there like a reason? To preserve the culture, because the language is being forgotten and erased at that point, and... She just refused to um, culturally identify as anything but Omaha. Wow. 
house. And that's all she would speak at home with her children, with her husband, like with anyone. She wouldn't speak English or French. That's, that's very cool. Even though she like could. That, yeah. Like that yeah. Um, so Susan could actually also speak English, French, and Omaha, as well as Oto. O- Otoi? I'm not exactly Other sure. Other one? No, it's O-T-O-E. Oh, okay. So I, I think it's another language from that region. But she had three older sisters, Suzette, Rosalie, and Marguerite. And she also had an older half-brother from her father, who was named uh, Francis Lafleche. And he became a renowned ethnologist, anthropologist, and musicologist, focusing on Omaha and Osage culture. Oh, wow, that's a lot of... Uh... So you use resume. I'm sorry, yeah, these were all degrees he held? Um, I guess, or jobs he had. Uh, jobs, okay. So Susan, growing up, was taught the traditions, songs, language, um, ceremonies of her people. But her father never gave her a native name. She never got like a true Omaha name. She was named Susan at birth. Okay. And um, this was because he strongly believed that um, the white people were taking over, which, you know, they really were, um, yeah. unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, so he, he wanted them to be able to like integrate themselves into white society. Or, you know what I mean? Like, he, he wanted them to be able to fit in, basically. Okay, kind of but like so, defense. Yeah. And his whole thing, like, the reason he actually got named chief was because the, the chief before him also believed that this was going to happen. Like, that we needed to integrate, or they needed to integrate, um, like, cultures with, like, white people and their culture. To preserve their own? To preserve their own and keep their own people going and safe and happy, but also to, like, just, like, make it in the modern world. Yeah, like, and just... safe from persecution, you know. Like, yeah. Not like... a not a great time then, you know. Colonization <laughs> is uh, violent. <laughs> yeah. So, th- like, that's the reason he got named Chief was because he also held those beliefs of, like, we're we're being taken over and we need to be able to like culturally identify as both essentially like not we don't need to erase ourselves but we need to be able to fit in with them so in a way it's preserving culture by not only you know continuously using and practicing traits of their original culture but also integrating it into a society that's developing yeah and becoming prominent rapidly and, changing uh, therefore helping well and yeah exactly and uh by that using their own culture to progress their own culture that culture to progress I, I, yes. and the other thing was like they yeah. their thinking was like they could both make the omaha culture and the white culture better by making like combining them you know what i mean yeah, like totally. kind of keeping separate traditions but like integrating like certain ways that the Omaha were into the white world and certain ways that the whites had into the Omaha world. And like, they thought that that could like improve both cultures, which it could like undoubtedly. I like that. Uh, almost you took. Yeah. Um, so with that in mind, he, they sent, um, Susan and all three of her sisters to like white schools and they they spoke English with each other, like because particularly her oldest sister was like, I don't know, she was pretty into like the white world and like she really wanted like that integration to happen. So she would only speak English with her sisters. So they, they went to a mission school that was on the reservation, but it was a boarding school run first by Presbyterians and then the Quakers. And so it was after uh, President's grants President Grant's peace policy in 1869. And the boarding school taught kids more than anything just how to be white. Like, it, it wasn't like a great education necessarily. It really just like taught them yeah, how to live in. programs. Kind of mm-hmm. like the U.S. in Alaska. Similar to that. Yeah, but, I mean, they did this all over America. Yeah. Generally, like, this one doesn't sound as bad, but generally they would like take the children and. Because this one was on the reservation, so it was partially run by the reservation and, like, white people. You know what I mean? So it was, like, a communal effort between both. 
but um, um, most of the schools at that time that were like boarding schools for Native American children would like cut off all their hair. They were not allowed to speak their native tongue. Like it was, it was extremely forceful and they were erasing the culture. A hundred percent is what it was for. Yeah, but complete erasure and just assimilating them into yeah. the, uh, the, new, the new colonization and cultural assimilation. Yep. That's it. And just, uh, why why you did and you genocide, wanted more, and genocide at the same time just you know stopping any sort of resistance to the end goal to the manifest yeah um so when she was eight years old on the reservation um susan sat with a very sick native woman and she was like dying essentially and they called a doctor four times and four times the doctor said I'll come immediately. I'll come immediately. I'll come immediately. And he never showed up and she ended up passing away right in front of Susan's eyes. And so that was her driving force for her future to become a doctor. Oh. Um, against the current. Yeah. Against yeah. the current. But uh, so her, like the message that she took from that woman ending up dying was that she's just an Indian. She doesn't matter. And so she said that her people needed a good physician to take care of them. Um, like yeah. So after several years at the boarding school, she left to study at the Elizabeth Institute in New Jersey for two and a half years. And then she returned to the reservation in 1882 to teach at the agency school, which was the boarding school. If I may, I was just thinking about this. That must have been very difficult in the sense that you are trying to preserve your own culture but then also using a different medicine like i would say western medicine but that sounds fucking ridiculous um it's not both western, indigenous but medicine indigenous medicine is the word i'm looking for so like to keep culturally that it would be indigenous medicine while also becoming a doctor and utilizing the new studies of western medicine like that dividing line so we got to keep in mind that this is the victorian era era so it's basically like medicine cocaine. you know what i mean yeah, like, is it... heroin and cocaine, heroin and cocaine. <laughs> medicine. let your hair grow better <clears throat> um so you said um i'm sorry that was no, go ahead. just get back so you said 1882 is when she returned to teach, yeah. To teach. And so 1880, she was born in 1865. So 1882, she's... Like 16. 17. Yeah, she's like 16, 17 at this point. She's, so she's going to start teaching at, you know... Fucking doctor. The same time that most kids are just barely graduating high school, she's returning to teach, like, medicine? No. Oh, no, okay. no, 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 no. Uh, teach. Yeah, so basically she went to a, um, the... The school, the boarding school on the reservation for a while, and then she left there and went to a um, the Elizabeth Institute in New Jersey for yeah. like a couple years. And so I think that was more like a high school situation. Like I don't think it was that wasn't a university. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because then um, from eighteen eighty four to eighteen eighty six, she studied at the Hampton Institute in Hampton, Virginia which was a traditionally black college that had started accepting Native Americans as well. And she was there with her sister Marguerite, her stepbrother Carrie, and 10 other Omaha children. So this school taught women how to be a housewife while the men learned mm -hmm. vocational skills. America. America. America, learn trade. Evidently. Be a good wife. And all you can do with, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, hope those are your aspirations. Not. Right. <laughs> um, so she actually had like a quick romance there with a Sioux man named Thomas Ikini Kepi, which is a really cool name. I don't know if that's the correct pronunciation, but it's very cool. Um, and then she like lovingly called him T.I., which I think is funny. But um, she, they, she ended up breaking up with him before graduation. I think she was a little too serious for love at that time in her life. Um, so she graduated on May 20th of 1886 as the Salutatorian, 
And she was also awarded the DeMorest Prize, which is given to the graduating senior with the highest junior year exam scores. Ooh. Yeah. Wow. All right. Killing it right out the gate. Um, and so then typically what would be expected of her was to either go and teach or go back to the reservation and be a good Christian wife. That sounds stupid. Go teach. No. She said, fuck all that. I'm going to medical school. Yeah. Get it. I won't tell you what you're going to do. So um, within the Omaha tribe, women were often healers. Like that was a really common thing for women to be. So it wasn't like very out there that she would want to pursue medicine. Except that she pursued medicine in the white world. And not just as a shaman type. I don't know if they had shamans, but... No, they... I, I mean, honestly, that's what I... Or earlier, what I was kind of... Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know if they were called shamans, though. I, I think that is an aboriginal thing. I think they are medicine me, medicine people. It's still, like, a traditional Healers. tribal medicine. Yeah, thing. yeah, a tribal healer. Okay. In D&D, we call that a cleric. <laughs> oh. um, yeah. So... In the Victorian era... Women were not doctors. Like, just, they just weren't. They, they, women in general, honestly, faced more discrimination than most races. And, like, a lot of women from that time even said, like, I faced more discrimination as a woman than as a black person or Native American or what what have you. Well, I think that has to do with, in many races and cultures, would be that it's often that the men wore throughout history, identified as the superior superior, superior gender. A um, lot of Native American cultures are very matriarchal, actually, and, like, the women hold a lot of power and stuff like that. Like, a Navajo women were, like, very, very powerful for a long time, and, like, they were typically, like, the heads of the culture. Like, the chief was a male, generally, mm-hmm. but, like, his whole council, a lot of the council and, like, everything like that would be very female oriented so that was a very like white world thing for okay. men to be the best of like right. but yes there's a lot of cultures worldwide that did think men were better forever but like typically not most native american cultures i love that because my understanding is that um many native american cultures would also recognize multiple gender identities yes and embrace that there's like the two spirit and things like that. Exactly. I, I, I mean, we're getting before. a bit off topic, yeah. but yeah, yeah, I, I thought that. that yeah, yeah so that definitely. Made me think of that. Okay. Um, um, sorry. No, you're good. <laughs> so there was only a co- like literally I can count them on my hands amount of schools that uh, offered a medical degree to women at all at this point in time, and um, it was stupid fucking expensive so she you know couldn't really afford it but she ended up getting accepted to the women's medical college of pennsylvania and it opened in 1850 as one of the only east coast schools to offer a medical degree to women um so she had a family friend alice fletcher who was a pretty famous ethnographer from massachusetts and she had many contacts in women's reform organizations. So at one point, Susan had healed Alice of inflammatory rheumatism. So she was like all about helping her. She's like, this woman's going to go far. If anyone can be a doctor, this lady can. Um, is that like arthritis? Am I wrong? Is that what that would be, rheumatism? Because I think... I, Alice told Susan to appeal to the Connecticut Indian Association which is a local sect of the Women's National Indian Association, who sought to civilize Indians by encouraging back-ass words Victorian values among their women. Um, They sponsored field matrons who taught Native women cleanliness and godliness. Sounds pretty gross. Okay. Super awesome. So here we go. So uh, inflammatory rheumatism is like multiple different things, I guess. Rheumatic disorders. And, uh, so it, it's all things just dealing with inflamed joints and muscles and tissue that, like, support your organs. Okay. Well, it's just, yeah. So there's, like, multiple spots throughout the body. But, uh, yeah. I don't know. That's it. 
So then I, I guess rheumatoid arthritis would just be like really inflamed arthritis. Like yeah. In the in joints. Yeah. Okay. Joints and muscles. I don't know. Yeah, that's crazy. Okay. Now we know. So, um, because Susan's goal was healing in a medical and scientific way, as well as teaching hygiene, which was very Victorian, the association ended up sponsoring her medical schooling. They paid tuition, housing, books, and other supplies, making her the first person to receive professional aid for school in America. Holy shit. Wow. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. That's crazy. It's very cool. Um, their stipulation was that she had to stay single through school and for several years after to focus on her medical practice. Sounds like okay. she was like, fuck yeah. <laughs> Sounds like Men? a deal to me. Fine. <laughs> so while in school, Susan studied chemistry, anatomy, physiology, histology, which is, it's like a microscopic study of the tissues of the body. Okay. Which is pretty intense. Um, and then she also studied pharmaceutical science, obstetrics, and general medicine. She also did clinical work at Philadelphia facilities with other co-ed students from nearby colleges. So she wasn't just like going and doing like lay mass clinical stuff with like the women at her school. Like they didn't like separate it. Like men and women were doing the same clinical work at this point. So that's pretty cool. During med school, she ended up dressing more and more like her white peers and she like wore her hair in a top knot like they did, which is like a bun on the top of your head. Mm -hmm. So between her second and third year of school, she had to go home back to the reservation to help her family due to a massive measles outbreak. And so she like went home and helped with that. And after returning to school, she would frequently write home with uh, medical advice to like help out the whole tribe and like spread that around, which is really cool. That's awesome. Do we we know if her father was still uh, chief of the tribe at this time? Yeah, I think he was for a really long time actually. Okay. until much later in her life. So she was heard. Yeah, really? definitely. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, and he was like a pretty well respected chief for the most part. Like, uh, there was certain people who were very um, old school and did not want to integrate with the white world in any way, shape, or form, and like totally rejected that. But that was kind of the minority. It wasn't like split down the middle or anything. Okay. Um, So she ended up graduating med school as valedictorian and top of her class on March 14th of 1889. Oh, wow. But, so this is the crazy part. So she was a medical doctor with a a degree, but because she was native, she wasn't legally a U.S. citizen. And because she was a woman, she wasn't able to vote. Well, well, I mean, that that doesn't surprise me at the time at all. It's just... At the time of the country. (laughs) Well, no, I know, but it's just mind-boggling that, like, she's a fucking doctor, and she's not a legal citizen, and she's unable to vote in our country. Uh, We're forgetting that she had a vote. Her country. (laughs) Her country, yeah, not even our country. Her country. Yeah, Yeah, that's fucked. But, yeah, at the time, people thought that going to school would hurt women's fucking reproductive organs because we were too frail and our menstrual cycles made us unable to participate in science. Yeah, I don't know. Can't confirm. Once again, not a doctor. Just playing on radio. But that seems totally uh, legit. (laughs) (laughs) Can't think. I don't know, man. Uh, I don't think of my uterus. I'm bleeding. (laughs) I can't think. I I just don't know. I feel like, well, in most cases, that might be a that might be an issue. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if I'm bleeding from the arm, yeah, if you're just, wound. you know, if I was just randomly bleeding, I don't know if I could learn at that particular moment. I don't know, maybe medical help. That would be a good time at a doctor. It's never held me up in school. This guy just got way off. I'm sorry. <laughs> there you go. Um, so after graduating, she went on a pretty big tour giving speeches at the request of the Connecticut Indian Association, which was the association that sponsored her school. Um, and she spoke to white people about how natives could totally benefit from being whitewashed. Yeah. She was pro this idea. 
Well, I mean, like, you have to think about her father and everything, and she was being, mm. like, basically paid off by the Connecticut Indian Association to say these things. But also, like, it wasn't just her going out and being like, yeah, we need to be white. It was like, natives could definitely benefit from learning more hygiene practices and learning how to, like, preventative health care and things like that. So she wasn't just directly like, we need to be more like you, but, like, we need to be more like you in these certain ways. I see. Okay. Well, I mean, that's just, I mean, yeah, I guess scientific advancement. Um, just, just take care of yourself. I mean, really, I'd say progressive for the world yeah know, definitely. In general, but i don't know that's necessarily whitewashing like well just because it, it was very much she was like playing into the victorian like cleanliness is next to godliness type of thing you know like in her mind it was definitely like hygiene leads to health but like the way she kind of projected it to get white people on her side was like Y'all got this shit right. Like, uh, we need to be like you. I see so, what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then in June of 1889, she applied to be the government physician at the Omaha Agency Indian School. So that's the boarding school she went to as a kid. And she was offered the position like two months later. So that was the, so she was basically the main position for the entire reservation. At that and point. she took this position. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so even after graduation, Susan maintained her ties with the Connecticut Indian Association, obviously, and they, they appointed her as a medical missionary to the Omaha, and the association like funded medical tools and books during the early years of her practice. Um, and then that same year, in 1889, she returned to the reservation to take the position as the physician at the government boarding school. Um, which was now run by the Office of Indian Affairs. Okay. Her responsibilities were teaching students about hygiene and disease control to stay healthy. Great. Yeah. Fucking and then like yeah. treating as in any ways that she could. So she actually had no obligation to help the overall community on the reservation, but the school was closer to most people there than the actual reservation agency. And Susan ended up caring for pretty much the entire community and the school children. The dull fuck. Okay, so she was busy. Yeah. She worked up to 20 <coughs> hour days. 20, sorry. 20 hour days. 20 hour days. Oh, wow, yeah. And cared for over 1,200 people. And so a lot of her time was spent riding in her buggy with her horses, Pot and Pudge. Oh. Okay. In like wrapped in a buffalo skin. Because it was very fucking snowy on the plains. Yeah. Um, so she would ride around through the snow to get to people, make house calls. And then usually she would she would get out there and make her house call and heal them. And then get back to her office and there'd be a line of sick, coughing people waiting for her to heal them as well. And she would. Oh, wow. She never turned anyone away. Like you're supposed to be the doctor, right? Yeah. You know, I actually take care of people. Was that something oath? The Hippocratic oath. Hippocratic oath. So not only did she help people with their health and like how to, like, and like I said, not just like directly healing people, but teaching people preventative measures as well. But on top of that, she helped people with letter writing and translating official documents and like all sorts of things like that. Because notary she's, too. <laughs> yeah, well, she's like a hyper literate person, whereas like many, many people on the reservation get like, if any, extremely minimal education. You know, especially in this time. Like nowadays, it's it's better. Yeah. So there's there was definitely a lot of completely illiterate people at the time. So they would like dictate letters to her, and then um, most people, if they spoke two languages, it was English and Omaha. And there was a lot of French things happening at the time. And like, like she yeah. could speak another native language, the Oto. And so she was like extremely useful in that sense of being able to help with uh, like notary things. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I feel like that that's very important, especially because <laughs> like you had said at the time, uh, I feel like yeah. also um, reading itself among all cultures, it was limited. Like it wasn't, you yeah, know, so. um, yeah. So just the fact that they were multilingual and um, 
education was a luxury at the time. Mm-hmm. More oh. so, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, even more so. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I mean, it's not in most countries, but America's just fucked. Well, that's what we're talking about. Poignant. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. So she was, like, extremely well-liked and trusted in the community, which is, like, a huge thing. Because a lot of people wouldn't even attempt to go see a white doctor because they just knew they'd be turned away or not treated as well. Or maybe even, like, Murdered. called... The doctor wouldn't murder you. I bet like, you some of them fucking okay. would. I bet <laughs> some of them would. Uh, Sweeney Todd doctors. Your neighbors are clans, man. You don't know. It's a thing. It's a thing. Okay, but yeah, so a lot of people actually avoided going to doctors at all, whereas she was extremely trusted. She knew the customs and the culture and spoke the language, so she could help everyone, basically. And so she did a lot of house calls. And she had a office that was 12 feet by 16 feet that would fill with people. And it was used as a community gathering place as well as like people coming to see her for um, health reasons. But her main, um, the main things she treated were tuberculosis, influenza, cholera, dysentery, and trachoma, which Which, I I don't know what trachoma is. I don't know trachoma, but I know that cholera and... um... All these TV. dysentery, uh, yeah, dysentery TV were very or killers. They were, yeah, they were fucking killers. Really, really mass really killers. Well, because well, that was before uh, antibiotics. Uh, antibiotics and inoculations. Yeah, and things, so. there was no cure for tuberculosis at this time, so it was just treatment to help people be more comfortable, essentially. And passing. And um and yeah. to not spread it. That was like a huge thing of hers. Quarantine. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to that a little later. Okay. Oh, oh no. Foreshadowing. Oh. Foreshadowing. Yeah, that's sad. So she did this work obviously traveling the reservation with the ponies, little Pudge. That's such a great horse name. Um so and she cared for patients, helping with literary needs for like twenty hour days, like I said, a lot of days were twenty plus hours. And she did this for five hundred dollars a year. Plus two hundred and fifty dollars from the Women's National Indian Association. No, that actually sounds like a lot of fucking money at the time. So in December of eighteen ninety two, Susan got extremely sick, and actually had to be bedridden for like weeks on end. And then at the beginning of eighteen ninety three, she had to take more time off to go care for her mother, and she ended up resigning to be there for her dying mom. Oh wow, that is tragic. Yeah. Um, but in 1894, Susan met a Sioux man named Henry Picot from the Yankton Agency, and they got engaged. And he was a divorcee with, I, I think that's a term for women, but I don't really care. But their romance, like, really shocked everyone around her, and I think it was partially because, like, divorce was, like, s- still very taboo at the time. Totally. And also, like, she had that one quick romance, like, what... 10, 15 years before this, you know, and that was it. So it was 15 years, or, roughly, I think it was 10. Roughly that she was treating, uh, that she was doing this work with her notary work and stuff. No, um, she started that in uh, 1889, so it was... Five years. Five years. Gotcha. Yeah, because she was, that was when she was in... in um, her first university, not med school, as she had the first romance. But so Susan and Henry had two sons, Carl and Pierre, and she actually continued to practice medicine. And she depended on support from her husband, Henry, but that her continuing to practice medicine after being married and having children was the most against the current thing that she could possibly do at that time. Because, like, once you had children... Yeah. (laughs) Um, cause like once you had children in the Victorian era, like unless you're Ada Lovelace and you could just hand them off to a nanny and do your mathematical work, uh, like see. you didn't keep doing things. No, like you, you were a mother. Watch your family. Yeah. yeah. You were a mother. And that was pretty much it at that point. Her practice treated people of all races and colors in surrounding communities. And if necessary, her children went on house calls with her. So I was going to ask, um, earlier actually. You, you had mentioned this 16 by 12 square foot room um, 
and said that she was treating these people. And my question was, did she have some sort of staff with her? Um, but really, it was her working. And then later on, she passed on this knowledge to her sons. Well, she would take them with her, but I don't think they, they necessarily, like, sat in the room with the patients or anything. Like, I, I would not bring my kids in to be afraid of them getting the illness that I was treating. That's a fair... Yeah, but yeah, um, and neither sure. of them ended up becoming doctors, actually. So right, cool. kids are kind of, you know, they freak germs for a, to bring more illnesses. Sick. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Totally. Well yeah. said. Still, not only was she caring for people's health, but she was also seeking to educate the community about preventative measures and the dangers of alcohol. She was heavily, heavily against alcohol. Which makes a lot of sense because at the time, like shady white guys were just using alcohol to impair natives judgment and they were like making terrible land deals where the natives got fucked and the white people got so much land for nothing. Right. You know, because they yeah, were like totally. getting them drunk and like doing all this stuff. So making shady deals and mm-hmm. kind of like the uh, Navy, uh, Navy's going out and hitting uh, taverns at the time and drunkards to hop on a ship. And, oh, yeah. And, and your life's gone. You're, you're a sailor at that point. Part of it now. You, you wake up on a ship kind of thing. That yeah. makes a lot of sense. Okay, so she was very anti-alcohol. Uh, okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So she went around and gave lectures on the dangers and of alcohol and campaigned for a prohibition in Thurston County. Though that did not happen due to crooked liquor salesmen taking advantage of the high illiteracy rate in on the res and passing out misleading ballots. Of course. Mm-hmm. Ah. Yeah. Probably wasn't illegal at the time either. No. Corruption. And then there was also uh, bribery involved in that. Like they'd be like, hey, vote for me and you get a bottle of whiskey. So, uh, gotcha. yeah, that was uh, that was cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> At this point, alcoholism was, like, spreading rampantly through the reservation and even affecting her husband, which he became an alcoholic. So she was even, like, more against it, seeing it in the home and, like, all around her. And, like, pretty much every aspect of her life at this point was being affected by alcohol negatively. So she lobbied against it her entire life. And then when the peyote religion arrived on the Omaha reservation, she like embraced it as a way for people to get in touch with their spirituality and reject alcohol. Ah, fucking hippie. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Well, but I mean, like you got to think like traditional Native American religions are extremely spiritual. And like she was more going back to like, go back to your roots, like get in touch with your ancestors, like be in touch with who you really are. And I know you were making a joke. (laughs) So beyond just liquor, she also took part in many major health reforms. She helped with issues such as uh, school hygiene, food sanitation, and efforts to combat the spread of tuberculosis. So um, by the food sanitation, I mean like people would wipe the floor with a rag and then wipe the counters and their knives with the same rag. It's the chain. Yeah. Yeah. So like that was a big thing for her was teaching like, hey, floors are really gross and our feet step in poo and then step in here and then we wipe that and then wipe the counter and then people are getting dysentery, you know? So, like, that was a huge thing that she did. And then, like, actually keeping schools clean for children so they didn't get as sick was another big thing that she did. But probably the biggest was combating the spread of tuberculosis. She was on the health board of the town of Walt Hill in Nebraska, and then she helped found the Thurston County Medical Society in 1907. Wow. So we're looking, she must have been in her 50s at the time? 40s. 40s at the time. Yeah. Okay. She would have been 41. Okay. So she was also the chairhead of the State Health Committee of the Nebraska Federation of Women's Clubs. And she led many efforts to educate people about public health issues, heavily focusing on schools as she believed that education was the key to preventing the spread of disease. Smart No. Smart woman. <laughs> Smart lady. Oh, yeah. Uh, so she was also very vocal about wanting or in needing a real hospital on the reservation from the time that she started med school, and she campaigned super hard for it because 
they didn't have a real hospital. Like that's why she worked out of that little tiny office and made so many house calls. And like that office was like in the school. So it oh, wasn't wow. even like, right. there wasn't like a doctor's yeah. office even. It was literally just like, here's a room in a building. There's, and there's, there's a stethoscope <laughs> here. Yeah. I think I can make it work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So all the campaigning finally paid off when the hospital was completed in 1913. And this was the first privately funded hospital on a reservation ever. Oh, wow. And it was later named in honor of her. So to put this into perspective, this is the first like major hospital on a reservation in America. And the first ever hospital in America was in Pennsylvania in 1752. So this is over 150 years before any reservation got a hospital at all. Wow. Yeah, that's a long time to just like... They, they have nothing like yeah okay that's a that's a huge step forward yeah and, and so this hospital was open to anyone that was ill it didn't matter their age race religion skin color what whatever like they if you are sick we will treat you her biggest objective was to alleviate tuberculosis which killed hundreds of omaha people including her husband in 1905 so no. oh, okay. So he didn't succumb to liquor or anything. It was fought against her for her life. Uh... So alcohol, like drinking heavily, makes tuberculosis much, much worse. So he actually died a lot quicker and in a worse way than he would have had he not been an alcoholic. Rough. No yeah. Way. Yeah. So in 1907, she wrote to the Indian office asking for help, but they said no due to lack of funding. And since there was no cure at this time, the cure was not invented until 1949. Susan told people to be cleanly, get fresh air, and kill as many flies as possible as they were thought to be the major carriers of tuberculosis. Okay. Yeah. All right. So fun fact about tuberculosis. It's one of the few diseases that is transmittable between any species. If I got tuberculosis, I could give it to an elephant or a dog, or like a dog could give it to a human, or like there's not many illnesses that can be shared between species like right. that to that extent. But TB is universally. Good. Yeah. Okay. So like it can affect like horses, elephants, cats. So like if you work or volunteer at a zoo, you have to get yearly tuberculosis tests. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, also, the test is sick. fucking crazy, and they, like, inject a little bit of liquid into your arm. It's it's nuts. It makes, like, this weird bubble, and you're not allowed to, like, fuck with the bubble, which is really hard to do. But if it, like, is, like, a raised hard, like, lump after a couple days, then you have TB, and there's, like, a certain amount detectable and stuff, but... Wow, wow that's so freaky. It's terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. never want to get tested for it again, but anyways... Yeah, so she wasn't just vocal when it came to, like, public health and safety, pretty politically active, and she was extremely opposed to the changing leadership and the continuing of the trust of the Omaha nation. Which she was vocal against the trust of the Omaha nation supporting... No, so the, the trust means that the, the government, but, like, basically the government, like, owned the reservation, technically. They're, like had a, a trust that was the reservation like they owned it oh, I completely and misunderstood. yeah okay. it's it's a weird thing um but yeah she she was not about that continuing because this was kind of at a point where it like could either transition to not being owned by the government or like continue to be owned by them and have like new leadership that was like whiter basically she was not about that she did not want that um, yeah, which, I mean, I wouldn't either, you know, so this, no, this is my land, this is yeah. my people's land, this is yeah. ancestral. Um, Nobody's questioning that one. Yeah. <laughs> so, speaking of land, when Henry died in 1905, he left her and her sons 185 acres in South Dakota. Um, but due to the land being held in a trust by the government... Oh. It took over two years for her to acquire it, 
And that was just her portion of the land that it took two years to acquire. It took longer to get the land and the money for her sons. I'm surprised she even got it, honestly, at the time. Well, she's fucking yeah. badass. Yeah, yeah. She she can write very strongly worded letters. <laughs> very educated, persistent. So the reason it took so long to get her son's land was because they were minors and a relative in South Dakota was the legal guardian of the property. So she basically had to prove that she was more competent than him. And, like, was more able to know what to do with this land. Uh, I'm not going to lie. For her, that doesn't sound difficult. She it sounds difficult for a woman in, in that kind of time period. Just yeah. Of, I mean, in that sense, yes. Society. But when it comes to proving that you're more, uh, you know, confident of said ownership. Yeah. That with what we learned i really feel like her competence would be more than uh yeah some land out in hick if you can yeah <laughs> well and so she kind of Fair um obvious. so she kind of did like a smear campaign against the guy to the government to get the land and she said like he's a drunk he's a terrible drunk and blah 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 she's and an like, advocate for it and she became that yeah so she definitely did all that and then she ended up getting it and she invested all the money that her sons got into rental properties on the land. And she used that income to sustain her and her children while she like practiced medicine and everything. So during this whole thing, she's still taking... Oh yeah, she's still doing it. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. yeah incredible. Um, and then so due to the successes of her fighting the bureaucracy of the land allotment and in winning... Uh, tons of members of the community started coming to her for help in their own cases, and she ended up being a defender of the L- Omaha land interests. Did she become a fucking attorney? Yeah, right. Like, kind, 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 of, kind of, of yeah. yeah. Like essentially, she was acting as a lawyer without any law school. She has many no hats. no bar association at the time. It was legal. Um, well, she wasn't, like, a officially being a lawyer. She was really just, like, help showing people how to skirt around the bureaucracy and okay. how to... Well, because what was happening in a lot of these cases was, like, um, it was so difficult for people to get their land that they were kind of just, like, like, fuck it, I can't... I, I don't have the money or the means to, like, fight this hard for this land. Um, and then white people would get it. I see, but she was, like make these people aware of their rights when mm-hmm. trying to make And she claim. would, like, help write the letters like she did back in the day okay. and, like, translate documents for them so that they could understand what was going on and what they needed to do to get their land. Mm-hmm. So, like, more that sense of a lawyer rather than, like, actually like, going to court and being, like, a lawyer. Giving legal advice. I know, see like, that. You don't really need to have a degree to give me legal advice. That's true. Yeah. Okay. It may be, maybe irresponsible, but not illegal. And uh, during this time, you had mentioned at the start of our uh, podcast that she spoke one language to preserve the culture. Now, that was her, was she... her mom. Oh, so I see. Okay. She spoke that was all mistake. four intermittently. I see. But her mother was the one who. Was yeah, saying, she would okay. only spoke, speak Omaha. That was a misunderstanding of mine because I was like, God damn, that's pretty fucking good. Yeah, like, <laughs> she's just. I got people translating it. So this, the work that she was doing, um, especially uh, fixing situations where white people were taking advantage of natives, lease and like lease, the natives would be like leasing land, and white people would like take advantage and end up just like homesteading it. You know what I mean? So she ended up fixing a lot of those situations. But through this, she was made very aware of a syndicate of men that was two Omaha men and three white men. Who were committing land fraud and basically just screwing minors out of their inheritance like they were just like making all this red tape and making it impossible for them to get it and just like stealing their land basically yeah um so she set out to take those bitches down (laughs) (laughs) um and it's kind of funny the way that she like went about it Because she had spent her entire life stating that the Omaha people were just as civilized as whites. But in 1909, she wrote to the Indian office to say that many people on the reservation did not have the competency to protect themselves from sketchy white dudes being slime balls. And they needed the guardianship of the federal government to, like, mediate. 
essentially. So that's like very opposite of what she'd said her whole life. So the next year in 1910, she went to Washington, D.C. to speak with officials from the Office of Indian Affairs and said that most people were able to care for their own affairs, but there was a minority population that didn't have the ability due to the Indian office stifling the development of business skills and knowledge. So like she was really like, hey, y'all fucked us over. This is your fault. You need to deal with it and make this right. It's a giant scam, and you are on the winning side of it, and you know it. Yeah. Like, that, that was... Yeah, but you and I both know it, so let's figure this out. Yeah. So she... There was... This part gets kind of confusing. So there was, like, a consolidation of the Ho-Chunk or Winnebago Nation and her own nation, the Omaha, where... The, she was always really against it and like a lot of people were very against it but basically like the the federal government like mashed these two together and they're like you're all omaha now i see which is like not true like they had the the ho-chunk had their own ceremonies and songs and dances and traditions that like and their own language but to these guys it was a uh, native to native mm-hmm. yeah. yeah and they so they, they kind of like mashed so like their um they put them on one reservation basically and like made it this, the same nation um it, but so through that consolidation there was lots of like news articles and um she was able to get lots of like proof basically that her people were being screwed and, like, all of the natives of the world, of the country, were being screwed. Mm-hmm. So she, like, used a lot of the news articles and wrote some, like, really intense letters to the government to, like, prove her point. Um, and she basically just said that the red tape created by the consolidation was just a burden to hold them back and proof that they were treated more like children than citizens capable of existing in a democratic society. Right, to the minorities. Mm-hmm. That's how they were treated yeah. yeah and they were just like treated like they couldn't run their own nations as they had been for who fucking knows how long you know yeah. at least hundreds of years it's kind of infuriating it's extremely Absolutely. infuriating <laughs> <laughs> um so she she worked really hard to better her community and bring them as much ed- education, freedom, and health as she could, though a lot of it seems to have been in vain because the Omaha Nation ended up becoming more reliant on the government and the Office of Indian Affairs rather than less reliant, which was like her goal was to have them come in and mediate and help them, like, give them those business skills and give them that knowledge to do all these things on their own and become like a free nation Mm -hmm. and then they ended up like stepping in a little too much and then her people just became more reliant on them than ever right so then it was kind of just like well correction now we're american basically you know so that was that's pretty shitty i mean that happened she did at least she didn't have to see that happen so susan who was lovingly called dr sue for much of her life I know, I love it. She spent her entire life afflicted with a chronic illness, which I, I'm not sure what. I never actually got a name or anything like that. Like, I don't think anyone really knows what it was. Interesting. Um, and during med school, she was having a lot of, like, breathing problems. So that was, like, pretty rough on her, too. But she also had chronic neck, head, and ear pain. And a fall from her horse in 1893... Which was the same God year. God damn it, Pudge. <laughs> yeah, Pudge. <laughs> but, um, so that was the same year that she already had to take up, like, she resigned to take care of her dying mom, you know? Mm-hmm. But the fall from her horse left, um, like, really serious internal injuries. And she ended up slowly going deaf from her illness. Which is crazy, because she practiced medicine until she died. And she was deaf. Like... <laughs> Just my and she spoke four languages. I don't know. It's mind blowing. Yeah, um, she slowly went deaf, and her health just steadily declined as she aged. And when the hospital was built in 1913, she was like far too frail to be the sole administrator. Though she did like run it, like it was kind of like her hospital. Mm-hmm. 
but she ended up dying of bone cancer on September 18th of 1915. So she only got to see the hospital in, in action for two years. Oh, wow. She didn't get to live through the war there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then the next day, the Presbyterian Church and the Amethyst Chapter of the Order of the Eastern Star. I, I don't the know what that Amethyst is. The Amethyst Chapter of the Order of the Eastern Star. If that hippies. doesn't sound like a cult, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what. Fucking <laughs> hippies. hippies. I don't know. That's, uh, <laughs> that's a lot of uh, adjectives yeah. and nouns for one place. But they both ended up holding uh, services for her. And she's buried in the Bancroft Cemetery in Bancroft, Nebraska, next to her parents, husband, and siblings. Oh, is it going to That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. Um, her sons ended up leading full lives. Carl was in the army and served in World War II, and then he ended up settling down in California. And then Pierre mostly just stayed in Walt Hill, Nebraska, and raised three children. So he was just kind of a dad. So while Susan was a doctor for 30 years, I think, 27 years, long time um she helped over 1300 patients within God her 1350 square mile region which was like on the reservation and like surrounding communities so that's imagine having to cover that in a horse drawn buggy in the snow oh yeah i said goddamn <laughs> that's impressive yeah, as fuck <laughs> yeah it's amazing she died when she was 50 so she wasn't even that well, I guess by our standards not that old but what is that like a pretty good lifespan then? with the time spent I'd say so with the time spent well, with the time sure. spent I'd say so I, I think for sure. white people at the time they could, they probably would have lived around like 60, 65 but like on the reservation I think that was a pretty damn good lifespan so with, all these, with no yeah. hospitals or like no medical hospital. care whatsoever yeah that's, that oh, yeah. seems Actually, pretty she's good she's the only one yeah. there yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah she was their only doctor like how yeah. did they even run this hospital <laughs> Now, I'm sure they brought in other medical professionals to run the hospital. That's good. Yeah. That's good. I mean, it was like a fully functioning, privately funded hospital, so it... Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, so, if you want to learn more and get even more in-depth uh, with Miss Susan, or Dr. Sue, there's a novel by Joe Starita, and it's called A Warrior of the People. So, you can read that book which I'm sure is super interesting, and uh, find out even more about her life. No. Yeah. Uh, one more time. Let's get Sue's full name. Susan Laflèche Picot. 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 That's right. It's a P-I-C-O-T-T-E is how you spell that. All right. Well, thank you guys for tuning in. We appreciate you as always, and have a great night. 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 Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed that, you can check us out on social media at Tenacious V's Podcast. Um, you can also send us an email with any ideas you have or if we were wrong or whatever to Tenacious V's Podcast at gmail.com. Um, you can listen in on YouTube, Spotify, and Podbean. And this episode was written, spoken, and recorded by Nona and assisted in the speaking by will and johnny the music for this episode was done by staple milk so we hope you guys come back soon